Good morning, church. Good morning, Jim. It is a joy to be with you all today to celebrate this great day of worship. We are Wellspring. We are the place where all are welcome, all are accepted, and all always means all. And we're so glad that you're here to join us for this time of worship. We encourage everyone to please take this opportunity to click the words see more in the, in the Facebook description. And there it opens up opportunities for you to connect in different ways. First of all, you see a, a, a link to register your attendance with us and to make your gift. We also have uh, links there that uh, share opportunities and ways that we connect with one another. So uh, we also encourage you to find that link that takes you to our e-news. Uh, the e-news is where most of our, the details are of anything that we announce here. So we encourage you, if there's something that, uh, that, that piques your interest, go, to the, go there and get all the details. So um, in that e-news, you'll find information on Vacation Bible School that's coming up in July. We have also uh, job opportunities that we have here at the church. And we'll be announcing a little bit more about that even next week. Uh, we have... Um, uh, lots of opportunities there, that different things that are happening in the life of the church. So we encourage you to, uh, to connect with our e-news. Uh, we also want to just share with you a bit about Holy Week. So Holy Week is <clears throat> going to be a, in, a great thing for us that uh, we have on uh, today being Palm Sunday. And then for the first three days, we typically haven't always done much in Holy Week, but each week there will be a daily reflect. I mean, each day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, will be a daily reflection that is an e-news. It'll come to you that way. So it's a good idea to register for the, to receive the e-news. And you get that and you'll have uh, Andy, Jessica, and me as we share, uh, as we share a further reflection on Holy Week. Then on Thursday, Maundy Thursday, uh, Holy Thursday. Uh, we gather here. We have a, a in-person and live stream at seven o'clock, and so uh, it'll be a it'll be it'll be an interesting hybrid experience. So, so we uh, invite you to be part of that on Thursday at seven o'clock, and then on Friday uh, it'll be a hybrid uh, Good Friday service as well with live stream and in person at seven o'clock on Sunday. We have Easter celebration at 9 and 11, and then we have, of course, we'll be here live stream at 9 o'clock, and in person, between the two services at 9 and 11, we have an Easter egg hunt that'll be starting at 10, 15 for children. So bring your, bring your kids up here and, and enjoy this opportunity to, uh, to share in this Easter egg hunt. Today, we're going to be sharing prayers of the people. And uh, this is an opportunity for you to share prayers. And so we invite you uh, at this time to write any prayer requests that you have in the, in the chat, in the comments. And we'll be praying for each other later in worship. So this is an opportunity for you to do that. So if you'll just simply provide your prayer request and uh, just a few words is fine or just a word. And uh, we will uh, we'll lift those up during a little bit later in the service. So, friends, we gather for Palm Sunday. We gather for the celebration of Christ's entrance into Jerusalem that leads to a week of dark, darkness. But it's, it starts with this, this interesting celebration. So come, let's worship together. Hear from the Gospel according to Luke, how our Lord Jesus entered Jerusalem, the 19th chapter, starting at verse 28. After he had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethphage and Bethany, at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say, The Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They said, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus. And after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. 
As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all their deeds of power that they had, be- that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He said, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, I'm Pastor Jessica bringing you today's Kids Minute. Throughout this season of Lent, we're preparing for Easter and moving toward Holy Week and we've been learning about the events of Holy Week and we've been building our Holy Week boxes. This is Palm Sunday, the day we remember Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem on a donkey, the very first story that we talked about. And the symbol for that one, if you'll remember, was palms. And this week we'll be remembering all of the stories that the symbols in our box remind us of because it's all one story, the story of Jesus. Today in worship, we'll remember the leaves or the branches throughout our worship service as we wave palms. And you might have something that looks like this in your box or you might have some other leaves and branches. Tomorrow, we'll remember that Jesus overturned the tables in the temple when he got really angry. And our Jesus symbol reminds us of that. Tuesday, we remember that Jesus said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. When he was teaching in the temple and that same day, he noticed a woman who gave everything she had, only two small coins to the temple. And we have coins to remind us of that. Wednesday, we'll remember that a woman anointed Jesus with oil, an extravagant gift. And we have oil to remind us of that. And Thursday, We'll remember the Last Supper that Jesus and his disciples shared together, that Passover meal when Jesus washed his disciples' feet and shared a meal with them that we now remember when we celebrate communion. And we we drew um, some symbols to represent communion on our box to remind us of that. And that was the last meal that Jesus shared with his friends. On Thursday night in worship and on Friday, we'll remember what happened next. Jesus went to a garden to pray And soldiers found him there praying and they took him away. And it wasn't fair because he hadn't done anything wrong, but
but they put him on trial. And some people were really angry about what Jesus was teaching and doing, while others said, this man has done nothing wrong. And after the trial, Jesus died on a cross and it was the saddest day ever. Those who followed Jesus were sad that he died and God was sad that Jesus died. And, and we remember that, we'll add a cross to our box to remember that Jesus died and the sadness of that day. And after Jesus died, he was buried in a tomb with a heavy stone covering the opening. And you can wrap Jesus in a cloth, uh, maybe just a piece of fabric or a, a tissue or something like that to remember that when you put him in the box. And we know the rest of this story, that when Jesus died, the story didn't end, that three days later, Jesus was alive again. That's what we celebrate on Easter. And next week, we'll hear more about that story and we'll celebrate together. This week though, remember the stories that we've learned about and add a cross and a cloth to your box so that you can remember even the sad stories, the hard stories that are a part of the larger story of Easter because we can't have Easter without them. Let's pray. God, we thank you for Jesus, for all that he did and all that he taught us and continues to teach us now. As we remember these stories, help us to know that you were with Jesus and you are with us now. Amen. I'll see you next time. Bye. Good morning. Thank you for that, Jessica. At this time in worship, what we're going to do is we wanted to offer an opportunity for prayer. After all, the people are crying out in today's scripture. And so it's an opportunity for us to cry out. It's an opportunity for us to pray, to go within yourself, and to lift up uh, your, your heart to God, your concerns and to share in one another's concerns and, and lift each other up in prayer. And so I'd invite you now, if you haven't already done so, to share any prayer requests that you may have in chat. And as long as you're up to date with the video, we'll share those. Some prayer requests may come after the chat. Feel free to interact with each other at that time. Let each other know that you're praying for one another. But at this time, let's go to God in prayer and then we'll display some of the prayers in chat so we can all pray for one another. Let us pray. We conclude our time of prayer this way. Would you pray with me? 
Lord, we cry out to be saved from sin, yes, but also from pain, from despair, from loneliness, from poverty, from oppression. As we praise you as our king, we also ask how much we are willing to contribute to the cause of your kingdom. We consider how much we are willing to take on the responsibility to work and to sacrifice. Help us not to simply expect miracles, but to roll up our sleeves and begin to do the work. Let us do more than sing songs. Let us walk the walk of faith. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. And now if you would join me in the Lord's Prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Good morning, church. This morning we're reading from Philippians, the second chapter, beginning with verse 5. Let this same mind be in you that is in, was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. From the time I was in high school, I fell in love with so many of our 19th century American novelists and writers. I loved the writings of Henry David Thoreau, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, and Nathaniel Hawthorne. There was one of Nathaniel Hawthorne's uh, short stories that became the subject of many of my sermons over the years. It was a story I shared when I was leading youth ministry, and it still offers new insights to me every time I read it. It's a story called The Great Stone Face. Without going into every detail, it's a story of a young boy, Ernest, who grew up in a valley where when you stood in just the right place, you could see a stone face etched into the stone on the side of a mountain. Hawthorne writes, the great stone face then was a, a work of nature in her mood and majestic playfulness formed on the perpendicular side of a mountain by some immense rocks which had been thrown together in such a position as when viewed from a proper distance precisely to remember to resemble the features of the human countenance. It seemed as if an enormous giant or a titan had sculptured his own likeness on the precipice. The legend held that the face was the face of a child of the valley who would rise up to be a great leader of the people. And when that person should return, it would be evident to everyone that this was the one whom had been prophesied by the stone face carved into the mountain. In the course of the story, Ernest grows up without going off for formal education or other pursuits and instead is educated as a laborer in the valley. His education is further derived from the countless hours he would spend looking at and contemplating, contemplating what the great stone face would teach him. He saw in the face a person of compassion and courage. He saw a person who cared for everyone and who demonstrated a kind of love beyond what the ordinary person felt. The stone face spoke to Ernest as he uh, looked forward to finding the prophetic heir to that face. And the story is that there were three people who had left the valley and who then returned. The men were appropriately named. Mr. Gathergold was the first one who had gone off making fortunes only to toss copper coins out of the carriage as he passed, uh, passed by, thereby making Ernest wonder if his name might, bore, might be more appropriately called Scatter Copper instead of Gathergold. Next was a warrior whose name was Old Blood and Thunder. It was his nickname. He hoped for for he was this hoped for Messiah that uh, was not not the one who had the compassion that Ernest knew would be there. Ernest was disappointed, but Hawthorne writes, "Fear not, Ernest," said his heart, even as if the great stone face were whispering to him, "Fear not, Ernest, he will come." Then came the politician named Old Stony Fizz. This, this was one who sought little more than higher office and who came into the valley amidst a parade with hundreds of people expectantly waiting to see the man of prophecy. But Ernest knew when he saw him, this wasn't the one. 
The story then goes that Ernest continued to spend hours listening to what the great stone face taught him. And as he grew older, his hair turned gray and he, he really began to teach with this fervor of a preacher the, the, the message that he knew that, 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 that came from the great stone face. And finally, there was a poet who visited the valley and he wanted to meet Ernest. And Ernest's popularity had spread And after a lengthy visit, Ernest took the poet with him to a place where he taught amidst a grove of trees where Ernest sat in the shade to listen. Uh, And people sat in the shade to listen to Ernest and and they they could see past him and they would look down the valley and see the great stone face. It was then that the poet saw it and proclaimed it to the people. The face that was now on Ernest in his advanced years was the great stone face. The people suddenly awakened to the truth that Ernest, having lived his life listening to what the great stone face taught, had himself become the person of prophecy. Then Hawthorne ends the story this way. Then all the people looked and saw that what the deep-sided poet said was true. The prophecy was fulfilled, but Ernest, having finished what he had to say, took the poet's arm and walked slowly homeward, still hoping that some wiser and better man than himself would by and by appear, bearing a resemblance to the great stone face. This teaching, this compassion, this humility, it was all based on the message that Ernest heard from the stones. Let us pray. Oh God, you call us and you teach us and you challenge us to be your people. And as we come celebrating this Christ who comes riding into our midst, we know that there's something more that you have to teach. There's a different way of seeing the world out of this. And so we pray in this time that the words that we share here together and the meditations of our collective heart might somehow be acceptable in your sight. For you, O God, alone are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So many of you know that we've been journeying through the season of Lent using Professor Amy Jill Levine's book, Entering the Passion of Jesus, A Beginner's Guide to Holy Week, which instead of taking the journey with Jesus as he goes from Galilee to Jerusalem in his final journey, this is a journey that, that we've been through all of Lent, starts on Palm Sunday and walks us week, every a day, every day through uh, each week going through the, uh, the, the, the Garden of Gethsemane, his arrest there. So we began on the first Sunday of Lent with the triumphal entry on Palm Sunday. We've already been here. We've walked uh, through other days of the week. And this week we pause to circle back to the triumphal entry once more as we really walk through Holy Week. This time, however, I'm looking at it from a slightly different perspective by using Luke's gospel instead of Matthew's gospel as we did when we started the journey. In Luke's gospel, there's much that is the same as in Matthew and Mark. They're called the synoptic gospels. The three, the first three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are very similar. John's a very different gospel. And Jesus comes to town uh, on the eve of Passover week, and it's always a little contentious. As I've stated, almost every week in the series, we have to pay attention to the fact that in a system of oppressive Roman rule, the last thing the Roman authorities on the ground want is a celebration based on the liberation of Israel, which is precisely what Passover is about. The same is true for the religious authorities who do not want to have the Romans tear down their temple or any part of their religious life. So the religious authorities are being very protective. And the only way forward for peace is for everyone to just stay in their own lane and not cause any problems. But then there's this Jesus coming into town and he's cause for great concern. The interesting difference between the various gospels is, a key, is key in a couple of places where Matthew's gospel has a donkey and her foal brought to Jesus for him to make, make his entrance. Luke and Mark have only one donkey. 
while Matthew doesn't specifically cite this in the, uh, the, 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 about the donkey in Mark and Luke, uh, Mark and Luke says that this donkey has never been ridden. Have you ever ridden a donkey that's unbroken? I have once, and I can tell you that it is quite a spectacle, and it doesn't look very kingly. Also, where Matthew has people shouting Hosanna, which translates to save us, Luke has people shouting something very different. They're shouting, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. And if you will recall, Luke has this clear image of Jesus about who Jesus is, this, this different type of king. And it starts at the very beginning of Luke's gospel in Luke 1. Mary's song of praise that's known as the Magnificat has these lines. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He's filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. So Luke is highlighting here the character of Jesus who comes as the king, who comes in the name of the Lord. And this is extra cause for for concern and trouble amidst this Passover celebration of liberation. And it's too much for the Pharisees in the crowd who themselves are just looking for peace, the kind of peace that comes from not having a disturbance in the first place. And they come up to Jesus and beg him to make his followers stop shouting that, that this nonsense about a new king, they need to be quiet. They will do nothing, but this will do nothing but cause the Romans to immediately crack down on things. Jesus, however, will have none of it. Not that he wants to become a king, but because the message of liberation is so powerful that it cannot be contained. He tells the Pharisees, I tell you, if these, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. And this is the power of the liberating gospel. It's the message at the heart of Luke's gospel. God comes to upend our notions of power and privilege. God comes to bring hunger to the full and to fill the hungry, to bring wealth to the poor and to send the rich away empty. This is not a message we really want to hear from our places of comfort. We live in a world that is top down. We experience a world where power over structures are the common way of keeping control. And the only way for us to have anything better to experience any freedom is to fight our way up. We live in a world where the rich and powerful always have more than one vote and multiple pathways of influence while the poor and powerless are resigned to having one or no vote and little influence. It is how our governments are organized, especially these days. And for most of us, it's how religious life has been organized. But Jesus comes as a threat to all of that. He comes talking of a kingdom that upends the kingdoms that define our lives, the power structures that define our lives. In his kingdom, the least of these, his siblings, are the one who, ones who represent the divine not those of us who function from places of power in either church or society. In his kingdom, God is manifested in all of creation and not consigned just to temples and church buildings. In his kingdom, Jesus rules from the place of homelessness and poverty. Stop and think about that. Jesus rules from the place of homelessness and poverty. And in the kingdom of Christ, all of creation speaks to what God is doing. So even if his followers could not be quieted, creation itself down to the very last stone could not keep quiet. And this, friends, is the Christ who comes offering a new way to see God, a new way to see the world, a new way to see ourselves. And Jesus does this from the bottom side up. It's interesting because uh, in even today, I woke up and read Richard Rohr's uh, daily meditation, and he talks about the uh, parabolic nature, this arc that tends to turn. 
And if you're if you know geometry, you know that a that a, a parabola is a is a an arc that's midway drawn into a, a conical uh, figure. And Jesus basically says it goes up and it comes down. But then if we turn that cone upside down, it goes down and it comes up. And so in Philippians, that's what the great hymn of Philippians is really all about. This passage that we read is believed to be a hymn of the early church, which Paul picks up and quotes as a means of talking about who Jesus is. He proclaims Jesus to be one who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something, something to be exploited or grasped. Instead, we're told he emptied himself. He took the form of a slave. So he's now going down. He's going down in this, this, this uh, parabolic symbol. And he goes to be the lowest of the low. He then submitted himself like a slave to die as a criminal. And this is a powerful text for us to consider on this day when we proclaim Jesus as the triumphant king who comes riding into the midst of power because we don't want this king who is going downward. We want to raise Jesus up to be king. We need the Jesus in the purple robe. We need Jesus with the scepter in the hand. But Jesus comes on an unbroken donkey as one who is humble. Remember that humble finds its root in the same word as the word human. The word is humus, dirt, to be humble is to, to come as one who is created from the dirt. It is to recognize not just our own mortality, but to recognize the fact that we are born of the dust of the earth. Remember that affirmation that was given on Ash Wednesday. You are from the dust and to the dust you shall return. And it's this very earth that then rises up to proclaim the power of God in this Christ who is now among us. So as we've been seeking to climb higher to find God, it was God who was coming to the lowest place in our world to find us. This is who, according to Paul, is found now in us. We're challenged to have the same mind, to let that Christ not just reign in us, but to be in us. We're then challenged to be part of the very same creation that rises up like the stones, to rise up from the dirt, the dirt that we are, to rise up and proclaim the power of the living God, to proclaim, we proclaim this Christ who is highly exalted and whose name is above every other name. And when we listen closely to the stones, we will hear this profound proclamation that Jesus Christ is Lord. So what is the implication for us here today? Is I've considered the two texts that we've read from Luke and from Philippians. I'm compelled to think of Palm Sunday as that which leads us beyond that awkward parade more than 2,000 years ago to see the Christ who comes dramatically, sometimes awkwardly, into our world today. This is a Christ who comes to upend our power structures and our ways of think, thinking. This is a Christ who comes to remind us of a kingdom where the last are the first and the first are the last, where the greatest is the least and the least is the greatest, where those who enjoy power and privilege are ruled finally by those who have neither. We're then called to manifest this Christ in our world, to have this same mind in us such that we might be the body of Christ who are willing then to lean into this awkward ride into the world that needs upending and to live with such obedience and humility that others will see Christ in us. Even in the ways we suffer and even in the ways we die. And if we will listen carefully, we might just hear the stones cry out. We might hear all of creation speak and we might hear of a Christ who has come to save us. Then if we listen long enough, we might find that Christ abiding deeply in each of us. We might just become the image of Christ riding into this world to transform this world. Amen.
Just pray that you can give Wellspring a priority among all the ways that inflation and the world makes demands on your uh, income. So thank you again for supporting Wellspring and its ministries, not only in this building and in this town, but throughout the world. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, you have given us uh, a house of abundance, a house of hope, and not a house of fear. So ease our anxieties wherever they may be. Help us always to delve deeply, more deeply, into your love for us. And know that sometimes we feel unworthy but we are always accepted. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.
Well, how about it, church? You know, this week is Holy Week. The five days that we dig deep, deeper, more deeply into our commitment to Christ, to Monday, Thursday, and then Good Friday into darkness, and then to the glory of Easter. So are you ready to make a commitment about how you will support the church, come closer to Christ, be work in God's kingdom, even though the world out there during the next five days, the schedules go on, the meetings go on, the shopping goes on, but find time to find a way to roll up your sleeves and make a commitment to Christ and his church. Christ is giving you this invitation. Christ is counting on you. So friends, as we part from one another, we go into a world with this Christ who who comes kind of upending things, who, who turns the world upside down in just a few days. 
And this is a Christ who comes into our lives and beckons us to go and be the body of Christ and carry this out in the world to be those who are like the stones and who rise up and shout and to know that all of creation speaks this message of praise, this message of hope with us. So go be the church, transform the world in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.